Morning, church. Morning, Morning church. <laughs> I like this guy. Pastor Mike's going to lead in prayer for the service this morning, but I, I want to say a prayer for uh, Pastor Ed and Carmen Brady. They've been in our church for eight years. They've been teaching Sunday school for seven and um, has had an impact on a lot of people's lives through that teaching. And they feel like they're in a season now where they need to invest more in their grandkids. Their grandkids are, are growing up and uh, you know they want to make, take advantage of these years. So they plan to go to church with the, that family and be part of their lives in a little more uh, practical daily way, weekly way. So we want to pray for them because it's their last Sunday with us. And Pastor Ed and Carmen will be teaching a class that goes right along with the sermon today, Thy Will Be Done. And so uh, I'm going to come down and just say a prayer for them. And I'm going to ask you just to kind of hold your hand towards them as a blessing. And Lord, we do thank you for, for Ed and Carmen and how you've worked in their lives, how you brought them together and how you brought them to our church, Lord, and no one expected that that night that they first came, but we thank you that you used it to bring them into uh, this fellowship and how you've used them to encourage and bless and build up so many people. We pray now, Lord, that you will answer their prayer to have a, a deeper influence on their grandkids, to help them to know and follow you as disciples of Jesus. We pray you'll bless them as they go, as in the way that you've blessed them as they've been here. And we thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, do you guys want to hear a God story? Like a really cool God story? Because they're all cool. Okay, on Wednesday night we did a lesson on the, um, the money lender for giving two different debts. And... Um, the song that we were going to do at the end of the lesson, we didn't get to. We, we ended up doing our lesson outside, which was kind of cool, but um, we didn't get to the song. Well, this morning, Rhonda and Gordy sang it as our closing song. They had no idea that, that this was a song we had picked. Um, and then also, Pastor's message talked a little bit about the parable that we shared on Wednesday. Now, last night I was in here kind of late, and I always... If, I, uh, if I'm here late, I like to come in here and just have some quiet time with God and, and pray. And, and I said to him, I go, you know, I haven't really heard your voice lately. And uh, today, oh, <laughs> today with, with that last song being sung and a pastor um, speaking about that parable, it's like God spoke. You know, it's just, it's just awesome how he just can, puts it all together and just make us so aware that, is, that he's here and that he's still, you know, he's, he's in charge, he's in control. Uh, it's just amazing. Um, I was going to talk about praying without ceasing, so let's do some praying. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you. You're so good to us. You've given us so many blessings. So grateful when, when we can see and hear and just be aware of, of you in our lives, the things that you are doing to direct us and, and guide us. Lord, we pray that you have your way in this service today. We pray that Pastor's message will be one that, that we can apply to our lives and that we can share with others. Lord, we pray that you bless the tithes and offerings, that they be used to increase your kingdom. And Lord, we pray for those who are not with us today, those who are sick or just not able to be here. Lord, we ask that you be with them, that you heal them, that you bless them, and, and we pray for your peace and your comfort and your joy over every one of us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Excitement before the uh, early service. A fire truck pulled up and an ambulance with the sirens blazing away. And, and uh, so I went outside to check with them and they said we're looking for 1108 8th Street well this is the uh, right block but the church is the only building and it's 11 11 11 9th Street so uh, we couldn't figure it out we knocked on a couple doors and anyway uh, someone in our service had a, uh, a 
one of those things around your neck that you push if you're in trouble. Life alert. Life alert thing. He had put it in his pocket and bumped against something. <laughs> <laughs> caused all kinds of a ruckus. So we, uh, we offered all the guys a donut and, and uh, sent them off with a blessing. But uh, uh, last week, there was a situation where uh, someone in the radio control tower at an airport got a call in, and a fellow very calmly said, uh, we just need, need to tell you we have a serious situation. And they said, well, tell us about it. Well, we're, they were flying from the Bahamas to Florida, and the pilot uh, passed out and went face down on the controls. And the plane started going nose down towards the ground. And it was a, a Cessna um, plane, a 208 caravan. And it has room for 14 people, but there were just two passengers. And the one, uh, this guy, Darren, he was uh, sitting in the front seat. And there were controls for both people. And so he took over and uh, pulled it out of a dive, which was just sheer luck, I don't know. I, and, then, and then he made the call and he said, I, I got the controls, but I don't know anything about flying. <laughs> and so they got a person on the other end who actually had done training in Cessnas and could tell them what to do. And he, step by step, told them how to get it level and how to, he said, just follow the coastline. He said, do you know where you are? And he said, no idea. I can just see the, the coast of Florida below me. He said, well, either go north or south and stay on the coast. We'll find you. And they did. And, and uh, he, this control tower gave him step-by-step -step directions, and he landed that plane without a scratch. <laughs> and they came and took the pilot to the hospital and got him the help he needed. And, and this fellow, Darren, uh, went home to his wife, who's pregnant, with a very happy heart. And God uh, answered prayers for them. We're always happy when it ends well, aren't we? But as I was thinking about it, I was thinking how much in the moment was Darren and that fellow in the control tower, his name was Robert, Robert Morgan, how much were they thinking about the past or the present or some other place? They were focused, weren't they? They were 100% in the moment, and they were paying attention with everything in them to the immediate need. And there are times in our lives where that's what we need to do. There are times in our lives, there, it, in fact, normally in our lives, we need to say, my life is right now. The past is done. It matters. It can inform me. It can shape me. But I can't redo it. The future is out of reach, and I can live to become something in the future. I can let my hopes and dreams shape me, but right now, what I do have some control over is myself right here, right now, and God wants us to do that. We often need to deliberately focus on the present to make the most of what's happening right here, because all of our living happens in the now. So we're going to look at a little video about this. Love reigns over the present.
His love reigns. And last week we saw how his love reigns over the past. Um, it doesn't mean the past can't be relived. It can't be changed, but it doesn't mean we can't change. And so our past does not define us, does it? Our relationship with Jesus is what defines us. It makes us who we are. It makes us what we will be. And as we go along in life, in the present, we make thousands of decisions, don't we? We make all kinds of decisions. Every day, all day long. What we're going to eat, where we're going to live, who we're going to love. Some decisions matter. It may matter a great deal whether or not you obey a stop sign. Some decisions really don't matter. It doesn't really matter what, which shoe you put on first. Probably all, we all have a habit, but it doesn't really matter. You don't need, even need to pray about it. I mean, it's not wrong to pray about anything, but uh, you, know, you shouldn't really even have to pray about the stop sign. Just do it. Yeah, and ask God to help you be alert. But there are moral choices that matter a great deal because they either draw us closer to God as we agree with his values or they become a barrier between us and God as we're in conflict with who he is. And God wants us to let him guide us. He wants to show us how to make these decisions. He wants what we are today to have a good impact on what will happen next tomorrow. So here's our key scripture today from Romans 12. So then, my brothers, because of God's great mercy, his mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and pleasing to him and is perfect. God wants to be involved in the details of our lives. He designed us to interact with him continually, day by day, to draw on his wisdom for guidance. He made Adam and Eve to, to know him by experiencing him. He made us all to react to him to be guided by his impressions on our spirit as well as knowledge in our minds or emotions from our past. He wants us to let him show us who we are and what he wants to do with us. And when we're making the right choices, we'll have a spiritual depth. We'll have an understanding of God. And we'll have a peace that passes understanding. So the question is, are you the person God wants you to be? And if you are, it's because you've been listening. You've been walking with him. You've been responding to his leadership. And if you're not, it's because you haven't really been tuned in. And if you see a need for improvement, it can happen. We can change direction. We can have a fresh start. We can pay closer attention and let God be our leader. We can pick up his word and let him speak to us. We can go to him in prayer. We can let him be our guide. And it's a good thing. It's the best thing we can do. A lot of times people will say to you during the week, have a good day. That's a nice friendly thing to say. That's a, that's a cheerful, pleasant thing to hear. And so it's a nice habit. But what does it mean to you when, to have a good day? What is a good day for you? Is it to have everything you want? Is it to have no problems? Is it to be liked? Do you have a good day because of your interpretation or because somehow you know God is pleased? Does he have a voice in what makes a good day or what makes a good life for all of us? And that's what this passage says to do. It says begin with God. Begin with reminding yourselves of how he's worked in your life. In light of his uh, mercy, Paul says, Make your commitments in light of what he's done for you, how he's forgiven, how he's uh, been patient, how he's waited on you. It's healthy for us. It's helpful for us to remember all the times he's treated us better than we deserve. And he's held back some bad consequences we maybe did deserve. 
And uh, it could have been different, but he's been there. And reminding yourself of his mercy helps us stay grateful. <clears throat> it helps us stay humble. And it keeps us from becoming careless or proud or self-absorbed. Think about his mercy, he says. And when you do think about all that mercy that he's poured into your life, offer yourselves back to him as a living sacrifice. A sacrifice to God dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. As we recall all the times we've needed his mercy along the way and how consistent his love has been for us, we become more willing to do what he says. We realize how much better it is to live in his will. And we gladly pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What a great prayer. What a great way of life. And when we pray those words, we pray, Lord, I want your kingdom in my life. I want your will done right here and how I think and what I say and how I act. And if you'd like to just meditate on that passage for an hour or so, go to Pastor Ed's class today. He's going to teach on thy will be done. And it's a, it's a, it's a way of life that we all need, isn't it? And uh, I hope there will be a, a number of people that will be there, Ed. I appreciate you sharing that. When we think about who God is and what he's done, we want to give back to him. In the Bible times, they sacrificed sheep and oxen, sometimes birds. There were certain animals that were acceptable, and they burned them on an altar. And it was a way of expressing repentance when they had sinned. It was a way of expressing gratitude for their blessings. I was reading recently the first two chapters of Leviticus that talked about how to offer these blessings. And I counted in those two chapters five times a phrase that appeared that says, pleasing to the Lord. Pleasing to the Lord. In fact, if you continue in the book, you'll find it over and over in the other chapters as well. The purpose of a sacrifice was to honor God. The purpose of a sacrifice was to give God a gift that he valued. And God was pleased when they brought him those sacrifices. And when Jesus came and offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice, God was pleased to accept it. He wasn't pleased, he, he wasn't pleased with any death. The death of a bird or, or a, a sheep didn't please God. The death didn't please God. But the sacrifice was necessary because of justice. And when Jesus died for us, God wasn't happy to see him suffer but he was pleased to see him make a way for you and me to be forgiven. You and I who aren't worthy uh, to, to pay for our own sins, who can't fully pay the cost. We had a debt we could not pay. And his love made him willing to sacrifice himself. And now he asks us to bring a different kind of sacrifice, one that costs us more and one that pleases him more. He says, I want you to come as a living sacrifice. I don't want you to come and die for me once. I want you to get up day after day to live for me. And uh, as living sacrifice is someone dedicated to doing God's will day after day and year after year. Now pastors have pointed out the problem with a living sacrifice it can get up and walk, out, walk away. It can crawl off the altar. It can stop being available. But you and I are called to be a living sacrifice, continually giving ourselves to God. That parable that Pastor Mike made reference to is in Luke chapter 7, and it tells about a, a king who forgave a, a two men. One, he forgave a huge debt, a million dollars. He said, uh, don't worry about it. I'm okay without it. You just go, go about your life. I, you don't have to pay me back. And there was another, he forgave five dollars. Don't worry about it, I don't need it, just go about your life. And Jesus asked the question, now which one of them is going to have a deeper love for that man who forgave him? If someone forgave you uh, for owing them five dollars, you might not even remember it a year from now. You might not feel a lot of emotion at the moment. You might just say, well, that's nice, thank you. And you might enjoy... Uh, 
uh, uh, ice cream sundae at Culver's on them and say, well, that's very nice. But if someone forgave you a million dollars, you'd probably remember that your whole life, wouldn't you? You'd feel um, a, a, a drawn to them. You would want to benefit them. You would speak well of them. And Jesus said, now, the thing is, you need to realize how much mercy you've been given. The thing is that I, I don't realize how bad my sin is. I don't realize how deep in trouble I am. I don't realize what it means to be delivered from hell. What a gift that is. We forget sometimes what God has given us. We forget sometimes how many times he's blessed us. We have no idea how many times he's saved us. You know, um, I've driven back and forth from our house to the church 20, 25,000 times. One time I ran into another car. Not pleasant. Not cheap. But all those other times was a mercy. Okay? There were times my mind was on something else. There were times maybe I wasn't looking in the right direction to see something. And all those times I had mercy. So he says, I want you to know, I want you to think of how much mercy you've been given and love God back. Love God back. Love him back. In light of his mercy, offer yourself to him. As a living sacrifice, we present ourselves over and over to do whatever he wants. We intentionally seek to know what he wants, to know his will, because we want to do it. And we realize along the way, this is good. This is better for me than my own ideas. When I was trying to do my own plan, it wasn't that satisfying. But God's plan is good. We've uh, taken canoe trips, usually with the teens. And uh, when you're in a canoe, uh, especially when you're going down a river, uh, it's hard to go straight. Uh, you have to take all those curves. And, and, it, and it's funny, if you watch other people in their canoe, it looks like they're going from one bank to the other, you know? And you think, for every mile of water that you covered, how many miles did you actually paddle? Two or three for each mile? And, uh, and so the point is, how do I get this thing to go straight? And the answer is, focus on something that you aim for. Something on the shore. Pick a tree. Pick a rock. Pick something that you say, I'm going right there, and if I start to veer one way or the other, I'll come back. Abraham Lincoln tells the story of a man who, whose boy was old enough to, to handle the plow one spring and he talk, took him out and he said now son I want you to start here and he said I want you to focus on something across the field and just go straight to it and he came back a little bit later and the kids furrows were all over the place and he said son didn't you listen I told you to focus he said daddy I did I I was pointing at that horse Well, he left out the word fixed object, okay? <laughs> and, and in our lives, we sometimes, we, if we get our eyes on the wrong thing, uh, we're going to go all over too. God says, I want you to fix your gaze on the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to go, uh, make it a true point to go to God's character, to who he is. And again, in light of his mercy, in light of his mercy, think about his goodness. Think about his patience. Think about how he's been there for you. Think about his consistent love and let that shape your attitudes. Let that be your focus for yourself. It doesn't come naturally to us, does it? Uh, what's natural to us is to think about what we want, what we like, what people think. And we may actually in life be convinced that God is holding back on us. You know, sometimes people are angry at God because he didn't give them something they thought he should. And there are people in our world, there are times in our lives, perhaps, that we think God owes me more than I owe him. Now, that's a dangerous way to think, isn't it? God owes me more than I owe him. I expected him to answer this prayer. I expected him to come through in this situation, and he didn't. And so we're angry. We say, you held back 
You didn't give me what I should have had. And God says, oh, if you only knew how much mercy I've had for you. If you only knew how consistently I've loved you. If you only knew how much I care for you right at this moment, you would offer yourself as a living sacrifice. But the opposite of a living sacrifice is doing what I want. And how's that working in this world? How safe does that make you feel? That people around you just care about themselves. Do you lock your doors at night? Do you take your keys out of the car? You have to. Because people are not thinking about God and they're not willing to be available to him. We must consciously make a decision to think and to act differently than the prevailing culture. And if you're going to watch TV and go to movies and read books and magazines and go on the internet, you're going to get all kinds of things thrown at you. But God says you must emphatically choose not to conform to what other people are doing, but to obey God's command. And here's one way he puts it. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Now, when he says don't love the world, Paul said don't be conformed to the world. When he says don't love the world, he's not talking about lakes. He's not talking about zebras. He's not talking about sunsets. God created this earth. He created this universe. He loves it. Every time he created something, he said, oh, that's good. I like this. He, he loves this world. He's not talking about people. God loves everybody. God, when God uh, brings a baby into the world, he says, oh, I love this one. And when God looked at you on the day you were born, and when God looks at you every day you wake up, he says, I'm very fond of this one. Amen. Very fond of this one. So he's not telling us not to love life, not to love the earth, not to love the people around us. He's telling us not to be, get sucked in to a system of thinking, into a way of living that leaves God out, that ignores him, that even resists him and defies him. Because there's so much life going on around us that doesn't take God into account. There's no gratitude for him. There's no sense of accountability to him. There's no willingness to serve him. It's just all about me, and it's not a good way. And the Bible says, don't follow them that way because you'll be sorry you did. And here's what he says. The world and its desires pass away. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. It's what God is doing that's going to last. What the devil is doing is going to be washed away. What, the, what sin is doing is going to just go by the wayside. It's all going to end someday. And it's... Someday the earth will be delivered from all of that, but what God is doing will last forever. And it's what he's doing in us that's going to last forever. The world system is sort of like slimy quicksand. When I was a kid one time, we, we were dumb. We were, we were boys, and we had no brains, okay? <laughs> now, I don't know how it was in Minnesota, just Michigan, a certain family I know. We weren't very smart. And so we'd all been in quicksand, uh, one time, I've told you, one time I could have died and the friend pulled me out. But we found this patch of quicksand and we thought, well, if we throw some sticks on it, can we walk across? <laughs> and so we took some branches and little branches and threw them out there and we, we could, it would hold us. Yeah, how long? <laughs> What's going to happen if it starts to rain and we're standing on this thing, you know? Uh, the world is like that. It'll hold you for a while. You can figure out a way to kind of make it work the way you want it to, but it isn't going to change its nature. It's always going to be undependable and unsafe. And someday if you decide to build on quicksand, it'll, you'll sink. And everybody around you will be sinking with you. It won't be good. It'll be a big sorry mess. God says... You need to realize how much you need God. You, you need to stay on the path he's given you on firm soil. Stay there. Don't leave it. Don't love the world. Don't get sucked into it. Don't go that way. And he comes to our rescue when we make those mistakes. Uh, all us boys were dumb, but we all grew up. I don't know how much smarter we are, but we're heavier. 
I'm just talking about my brothers and I. I'm not, not trying to insult you. But you know what I'm saying. We all have made a lot of mistakes. We've all gone the wrong way more times than we can count. Sometimes we've de defied God and just said, I want this. And his mercy's been there, hasn't it? He's pulled us back. He's kept us going. He's, he's brought someone along just in time. He saved us. And he tells us, now, don't take that for granted. Don't assume it'll always be that way. Praise him for what he's done, but there's a real danger of saying no to him one too many times. What we decide when it's today will determine our destiny on the last day. And we don't know when that day is. We don't know when time will run out. We don't know if we will reach a point of no return. Life as we know it will come to an end someday. And what follows then is the day of judgment. I've told you uh, before about a time I was asked to go see someone that was dying of cancer. I didn't know him, but someone who loved him came to our church and said, would you please go see him? So I went to see him. His name was Red. He, he actually died two days later. And so I went in, and when we began to talk about Jesus, he immediately cut in and said, I wish you'd leave. He didn't want to talk about Jesus at all. He didn't want to talk about eternity at all even though he was about to step into it. And I've told you about the pastor who went to see a young man in his church. He'd grown up in that church. He had, he'd, he'd learned about Jesus in that church. He had accepted Jesus as a boy. But now, in his young adulthood, he was living the opposite way. He was doing whatever he wanted. He was just out to have a good time. And the pastor went and appealed to him and said, Son, I, I hope you'll come back to the Lord. And he said, Oh, pastor, I will. He said, I've got it all figured out. He said, there's a lot of stuff I want to do that I want to do. But he said, when it gets down to the end and I'm going to die, I'll give my heart to Jesus then. Yeah. He said, Pastor, I, I figured out I'm going to be like the thief on the cross. Yeah. And if you've heard me tell the story, maybe you're asking yourself, you're saying the answer the pastor gave. Which thief? Which thief are you going to be? Are you going to be the one who repented or are you going to be the one who died with anger and hostility toward God on his lips? You see, we can't, we can't know what, how we will shape ourselves and what we will be like later. Because what we decide now and not only affects now, but it shapes us. And just like that fellow read, I don't know his story, but he wanted nothing to do with God. And yet he had to answer to God. We know that. And so the Bible says, make good use of now. Here's what it says. The Holy Spirit says, listen. Today, listen to what the Lord says. Do not be stubborn as in the past when you turned against God. So brothers, be careful that none of you has an evil, unbelieving heart. This will stop you from following the living God. But encourage each other every day. Do this while it still is today. Help each other so that none of you become hardened because of sin and its tricks. You have today. You can't change what you did yesterday. You can't be sure what you'll do tomorrow. But right now, you can decide. But we can get so used to one day leading to another. We can get so used to going to bed and waking up. We can get so used to running through the day and going to bed that we forget there's a definite limit. Someday we won't get up. Someday we won't return to our bed. Someday it will all stop. There's an important action we need to take today because we don't know if it's our last day. We can be lulled into the habit of repeatedly waiting for someday. Oh, I'm going to do that, but not right now. I've got... I've got a tool bench that I've done that with. Someday, I'm going to bring order to this thing. It just hasn't happened yet. And the same thing can happen in my heart. It can happen in my attitudes. Someday. But it doesn't come. We experience God's grace and his mercy so richly, we presume it'll always be there. But there is a limit to our lives. There's no limit to his grace. There's a limit to our ability to tap into it. 
Many times people don't intend to say a permanent no to God. They're just saying later, God, later. But not yet sometimes becomes a permanent no. We have a limited amount of time in the world and we, we don't know when it's going to end. I may go to the doctor tomorrow and he may say, Adele, you have six months. But I could die in a car accident on the way home. I could bump my head. I could eat the wrong thing. I don't know I have six months and neither do you. We don't know we have six minutes. Last Sunday, a fellow went into a church in California. He put chains on the doors so they couldn't be pushed open. And he started shooting in the sanctuary. They were able to stop him, but the pastor was killed and four other people were wounded. You don't know. You, you don't have a place you can go where nothing bad will happen. And that includes your own bed in your own house. Might be the most dangerous place to be. You might go home and see a hole in your roof and a meteorite sitting on your bed. You say, man, I'm glad I went to church. <laughs> we don't know, but what we do know is we must not put off God. Don't put God off. Don't tell them later. Don't tell them maybe. Don't put them off. No one knows what will happen any day. The most dangerous place could be home. But open up and accept the gift of forgiveness that Jesus makes possible. It's within your reach, but you have to take it. Let him guide you into the life he intended for you when he made you. God has this beautiful plan, but we can totally ignore it. Don't do it. Don't ignore it. Don't miss it. He warns all of us not to get stuck in the past. He warns all of us not to wait for some future time when it'll all be ideal and then we'll change. But come to him now. Walk with him steadily. Be his people. One more verse. God says, at the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Listen, now is God's acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Anyone who comes into God's family is going to make a decision on some today. Today is the day. If you've been telling God no, if you've been saying to him not yet, you were meant to be here today. God is speaking to you today. He's calling you to himself. It may not be your last chance, but it might be. There's no way to know. What we do know is right now, here I am. And here he is. Amen. Let's talk. Let's make a commitment. Let's be his. So whether you've been following him, whether you've been fighting him, make your next step the one that puts you in his hands and in his will. Amen. Pastor Mike and I are going to be available to pray with you after the service if there's something in your life you just want to make sure of. If you're not sure you belong to Jesus, if you're not sure you've given him your life, then you can make sure. If you know there's something out of step with God, you can get it right today. You say, oh, Pastor, I prayed about that 16 times already. Well, good, let's pray the 17th time and let's believe together that God is still working. Okay? Because he does. He does. And uh, let's uh, sing this song and then we'll pray and you be ready to say yes if God is prompting you to take a step towards him today.
Maybe you can play that again, maybe hum it. Maybe we can have the words back up here as they do that. And let's think for a minute of what God wants to do in our lives. Is there someone you need to forgive? Is there something in your life that you need God to change? Is there some way that you're thinking, some attitude that he needs to transform? It says, be transformed. That means God is doing it. It's God's power making it happen. It's God's will being fulfilled. It's you cooperating. It's you coming saying, okay, God, let's do this. And, and you're not irresponsible, but you're just there for the ride as he works. You're just agreeing over and over, okay, God, let's do this. If there's something he wants to change in your life, would you just bow your head right now? Would you talk to him? If there's something he wants to do that hasn't happened before, would you ask him, let it loose, Lord. Bring it on, Father. Do this in my life. If there's someone you're meant to influence, Lord, I'm ready. Would you use me? If there's something he wants to do, would you say yes today? Would you bow your head and do that? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came into this world not to conform to it, but to transform it. You came into a dangerous, violent world where people were resisting and fighting against your Father. And you said, every single day, I will do my Father's will. Every moment of every day, I will yield myself to him. I will be the person he called me to be. Thank you, Jesus, for living a perfect life. And thank you, Lord, that you were willing not to, not to be rewarded for that perfect life and to leave us in a mess, but to sacrifice yourself so that we could be forgiven, so that we wouldn't have to get what we deserve, that we could have mercy. And in light of that mercy that we have because of you, we want to follow your example. We want to hear your voice. We want to be the people you're calling us to be. And Lord, we're not finished products. Every one of us here still needs to have you transform us in some way. Many of us, Lord, have fought for, against something for years. But today, we say yes to you. And we thank you that it's real. We thank you that your power is there. We thank you you're doing something. And you're going to do more as we agree to it. And so take us, Lord Jesus. Make us what you want us to be. Use us in this world. Might we not only not conform to the world, might we show them a better way? Not because we're better people, but because you're a better answer. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like prayer, Pastor Mike and I are just going to hang out here in the front. And if you're leaving, we're not stuck up. We're just busy. And we trust that you'll have a godly week. And uh, say a word of blessing to Pastor Ed and Carmen, if you get a chance. The Lord bless you all. Amen. Turn off. No town, I'm gonna leave this world with shout. Sin will be gone. And things will be right Keep looking up He may come tonight My heart's overflowing With joy and peace Cause I'll soon be resting At His precious feet It may be in the morning It may be at noon I don't know when He's coming But I know He's coming soon He's coming soon There's no doubt